difference. In any event, uh, Mayor asked an excellent question yesterday. Uh, Mayor, you remember you asked, why is this, uh, we were talking about Aaron Akoi not being included. Mayor, you asked, why is the Kohen the one who does the, uh, the Paraduma? So I was actually looking, I looked up a little bit, and it turns out that it goes in two directions. There are different, like, like always, the commentaries, uh, just at 838, uh, the, the, uh, the, what do you call it, the commentaries here um, go in two directions, which you often find. One opinion is, well, the Kohen has to be involved because Aaron does need an atonement because he was involved with the golden calf. And therefore, it's given to the Kohen. The, uh, not like what we said yesterday, that Aaron was involved, therefore he has to, since Aaron is the Kohen and he was involved in the golden calf and the Paraduma, the red cow is an atonement, so then the Kohen, it is assigned to the, uh, the, to the, to the Kohanim to do, to do it. That's one opinion. The other opinion is, goes in the opposite direction, to the contrary. Since it's such an important thing, the Paraduma, the red cow, is such an important thing. So it's assigned to the Kohanim, like they get all the, all the important jobs are given to the Kohanim. But since it is slaughtered outside of the base Migdash, they don't slaughter in the base Migdash, it's not a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. It's slaughtered outside on the Mount of Olives. So Aaron Akoin, who is the Kohen Gadol, he doesn't do it because he doesn't leave the base of Migdash. But it is an honor. So there's one approach that says it's an honor. The other approach says that it's an atonement. And it could be that it's a little bit of both. But that's what the, uh, that's what the Mephorshim say. Okay, so yesterday we had a few more points we wanted to go through here. Uh, the first one is that the, the, the baffling part of the Parah Duba is how something that the person involved in the preparation becomes Tame, yet the person that it's sprinkled on becomes Tahor. And that paradox is what Shlomo HaMelech says I can't figure out. That's the, that's the specific point that Shlomo HaMelech couldn't figure out. Now there are a couple of ideas here. First of all, the basic explanation is, and what the commentaries compare it to, is you know, you could have a medicine, or you give a medication to one person and it treats him, if, if he needs the medication, it's good for him. So somebody who is not feeling well and you give him a strong antibiotic, he'll start feeling better. But somebody who's feeling perfectly okay and you give him the antibiotic, so then he might start feeling queasy and, and whatever it is. And it could be with other medications as well. So here, the person who doesn't need it, what's right, the medicine, quote unquote, that's right for, his, certainly a spiritual medicine, that's right for one person, isn't gonna necessarily be right for the other person. So it makes him tummy and it makes him tar. That's, the, that's what the commentaries go into. Even more than that, when you stop and think about a paraduma, why the red cow? The red cow, you see, death is the, high, what, death is the highest form of pure physicality. Because when somebody dies, you know, there's, there's an actress, I went to one of these mindless actresses, uh, they were interviewing her about her career. You know, one of these talk shows. So they talk about her career, and you know, they always ask her, well, tell us one flaw that you have. You know, because I'm too kind. <laughs> you know, you know you, you, there's always something like that. You know, I, I, I'm too generous, you know, something like that. Okay, shkoyach. And, and that, no other flaws, other than that, she's a, she's a walking Miss Alicia Sharon, other than that. But the, the uh, so at some point, there had been some disaster in Indonesia or something, so at a certain point, they finished with the interview, they said to her, you know, what do you say about that disaster in Indonesia? So she goes, you know, well, you know, death is really terrible because when you die, a big part of your life is gone. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much. And, and uh, so a big part of your life is gone. So, so the, uh, and it's very time consuming. So, uh, so the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it? The, the, a, a dead body is the ultimate in physical because there's nothing spiritual about it. There's nothing ruchni. The nishama is gone. It's pure physicality. When it comes to physical, the pure physical, the most physical drive we have is eating, right? Eating is purely a physical drive. We share, that's a common, the Gemara says that's one of the common characteristics we have with animals, right? Relieving ourselves is also a characteristic we share with animals. Procreation is also a characteristic we share with animals. But the most physical thing that we're constantly involved with is eating, food. The most physical food is meat, right? Meat is the most physical food. Vegetarians uh, feel that it's wrong to eat meat. Right, which uh, 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 meat represents, you know, killing a living being, 
and eating it. And meat is, and of all forms of meat, the most physical form of meat is beef as opposed to chicken or fish. And therefore, the Pora Aduma represents the person who is confronted with spiritual death. He is himself a physical person. And the Pora Aduma alludes to the idea of slaughtering the physical, the ultimate in physicality, which is a piece of beef, mixing it with water. And water always represents what? Torah. Torah. In Mayim Ala Torah. Water is represented by Torah. That means that for a person to get out of the symbolic death of not being completely devoid of anything ruchni, of anything spiritual, for a person to get out of that, you take the physical, which is represented by the cow, mix it with the water, which is Torah, and that's the way a person can become purified from the physical drives. Now, obviously, we have said many times in Torah, we do not, dis, we do not, we are not, what's the word, ascetics? We're not ascetic, what's that? Aesthetic. No, aesthetics is nice, pretty things. Oh, aesthetics. aesthetics is people, oh. Like people who neglect. tried, people who tried to, uh, the, 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 you know, completely uh, neglect the physical world. We don't neglect the physical world. We we use and we control the physical world as long, as opposed to letting it to, letting it control us. So I once had a girl at my house who was a vegetarian, obviously a feminist, and uh, and she was at my house for Shabbos. You know, with 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 the with the, I mean, you can picture the package. You know, it was just that. You know, the, even the way she talked. And and the, uh, the the you know see I, I was I was in cola at the time I wasn't looking for trouble I was I was just in cola somehow she ended somebody's guy she ended up at her house and I was just trying to make conversation we're sitting at the Shabbos table and uh, you know she's a vegetarian and the vegetarians somehow have a habit of letting everybody around them know that they're vegetarians very quickly and uh, that becomes the subject of their conversation and uh, uh, the purpose of life and uh, and and uh, the purpose, somehow the purpose of white life becomes to eat legumes. And uh, so she, we're sitting at the Shabbos table, and you know, we're just trying to have a pleasant meal. And, and at a certain point, I said, "Make out." I said, "Well, do you eat fish?" And so she said to me, "If it, no, if it has a heartbeat, I don't eat it." So I said, "Yeah, well, we don't either. We kill it first, right?" And, and then we we got along got along famously after that. You know, we had a, we had a wonderful Shabbos. I had another girl once who <laughs> had another girl once who was over uh, who was over. And she was, she also was, uh, you know, but she was actually, she had, she, she was actually a little bit, a little bit, uh, uh, a little softer. So she told me that, that, that she's actually a conductor. She's a conductor. And I said to her, uh, really, you know, I've always wanted, I've always wondered, you know, how do you get those trains around the curves? You know, you know, do you have to slow down around the curve? You know, she was one of these conductors. And at least she had a sense of humor, so she was able to laugh about it, you know, that, that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we, we, don't we, we don't deprive ourselves, we control ourselves. There's a very big difference. And therefore, that's one of the ideas. Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein says, what is the Torah trying to get at when the Torah says that it makes one person pure, impure, and it makes another person pure. So Rav Moshe Feinstein says two things, very, very important. Both of them are essential. The first thing he says is that when it comes to serving Hashem, don't look at what another person is doing and mimic him or imitate him. Because your way of serving Hashem is not necessarily the right way for me. And my way of serving Hashem is not necessarily the right way for you. What makes me Tahor may make another person Tameh. And what makes you Tahor may make me Tameh. So for example, you have one person, let's say, who's got a really serious intellectual drive. And this is a guy who's able to sit down in front of a Gemara and not move from a Gemara and learn to a Gemara 12 hours a day. And another guy who may be a little bit more active and a little bit more energized and he needs to be express himself by, you know, doing things for other people and so on and so forth. He'd be, be involved in chesed and that sort of thing. So just because you're doing it doesn't mean it's the right thing for me. Sometimes you see a guy, well, this guy Davin Shimon it takes him a long time to Davin I should Davin a long time too. But if I try Davin a long Shimon I lose my concentration. And, and sometimes if, if you try to go for too long, then your mind starts to wander. So each person has to find what's right for you isn't necessarily going to be the right way for me. You have one person who may take halacha and be very, very stringent on himself halachically, and it's good for him. You have another person who tries to be stringent, to take, and we're not talking about the letter of law, we're talking about adapting, ad adapting stringencies in halacha, and all it does is make him nervous. 
And who said that you should do that? The Torah is challenging enough and demanding enough without having to go and take volunteer, volunteer areas of, 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 of restriction. And so Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says that in all areas of life, a person has to know what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for someone else. He's got an interest in learning Chumash. He's got an interest in learning Halacha. Well, maybe I should learn Halacha, but I find Halacha too dry. So I'm not going to be as energized when it comes to learning Halacha. And if he learns Chumash and he learns Gemara, everybody's got to find what's right for them. And obviously you need a... You need guidance and a mentor in order to do this. Often a person, you know, uh, a person needs a little bit of guidance because what feels good and what feels right isn't always right. So that's also a danger. So you always need a certain amount of guidance for it. But that's the first lesson. The second lesson, and this is really, uh, is, 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 is really uh, 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 something that we have to think about. Various traits that we have, we have to know that there are opposites and they have to be used in opposite ways. So for example, when it comes to myself, I have to exercise a certain amount of restraint. When it comes to treating, let's say, let's say spending money. On myself, I should not spend money just because I feel like it. Sometimes, they listen, okay, you want it, but sometimes you know, just because you want it doesn't mean you should have it. For other people, I have to be generous. With myself, I have to be a little bit more rigid. With other people, I have to be more generous. When it comes to, um, um, uh, what was the other example I had? There was one, one of them was generous. Yeah, when it comes to, uh, for a person himself, he has to be humble. And a person should certainly not pursue honor. On the other hand, when it comes to other people, you have to honor them. You have to honor other people. So on the one hand, I have to avoid it for myself, but I have to give it to other people. And, and by the way, just in general, it, it, being complimented, so that people start getting, you know, they, they, they start studying Musser books about humility and somebody gives you a compliment, you go, no, 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 no. it's okay to get complimented. You're allowed to be complimented. If somebody compliments you, you know how you respond to a compliment? There's only one way to respond to a compliment. Say thank you. That's all. You know, thank you. Don't, don't start saying, no, I didn't really do it. That's not, that's not, that's not humility. That's not, that's not, that's not, everybody enjoys very few people in the world that I've met do not enjoy a compliment or some sort of positive feedback. And if somebody gives you a pie, you did something well, somebody compliments you, they've given you a gift. What do you say when somebody gives you a gift? You say thank you. Somebody compliments you, say thank you very much. It's very kind of you, very nice of you to say that. And if somebody compliments you, somebody compliments you, you say thank you. But when it comes to ourselves, we, have to, we shouldn't pursue prestige and honor, yet we should shower it on other people. It's interesting. And therefore, the paradox of the Parah Duma is that a person has to know that you have to that you have to be able to turn it on and turn it off. You have to turn it on off and for other people, and for yourself you have to be turned it off. That's the paradox of how you could have the opposites existing. And Ramosha Feinstein says that's what the Torah is emphasizing here. Now there's there, there, there's a very interesting concept. At Rav Chaim Shmulevitz was the Rosh Hashiva of the Mir Yeshiva. One of the Gedolei Ador. And Rav Chaim Shmulevitz he once walked in. He once walked into a certain yeshiva, and when the other rabbanim stood up, he stood up for him when he walked in. So somebody said he was young at the time, and he said to him, "Why, why did you stand up for him?" He's very, he said, "When the library of the Mir Yeshiva walks in, I stand up." Now, he was just vast encyclopedic knowledge. So Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, at a certain point, became the Rosh Yeshiva of the biggest yeshiva in the world, of the Mir Yeshiva. And one day he invited the boys over to his house for like a Hanukkah, Hanukkah Masiva celebration. And they were in the house. And as the boys were leaving, he went, his wife put out refreshments and cake. And one of the boys saw him in the, in the kitchen complimenting his wife effusively over the cake. So uh, one of the boys asked him afterwards, you know, I understand the husband should come. I mean, you're really, you're really laying it on thick. You know, what was that all about? He said, listen, I know how good I feel when somebody compliments me after I give a shear, when somebody compliments me on that shear, a woman baking a cake, that's like a man giving a shear. And if a woman bakes a cake, you have to compliment her. You know? and, and I've never met a woman yet who can turn down a compliment. I'll sell this to you guys. If you want to pay me, I'll sell you a tip. <laughs> I stumbled across this accidentally. When I used to, and I used to do this at a certain point, it was so effective, I used to do it just because it was fun. I haven't done it in a while, I really should. You know, sometimes you say something, your wife doesn't hear you. And the other, you say, where are my, you know, where are my sports socks? You know, I want to play basketball. She doesn't hear you, right? Yet, when you use an adjective to her, she'll always ask you, what did you say? And you say, oh, by the way, the yesterday was really excellent. 
What? 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 Right? Right? Try it. And I've gotten my wife's attention. Maybe I'll mumble. I used to mumble in high school. I, I was a great mumbler because I'd walk in late. The, the Kaplan, where were you? I was going to go there. What? I was going to go there. All right, just sit down. Just sit down. <laughs> you didn't want to make it up. I was really good at it. And, and so, so my wife, uh, once in a while, I would just go, you know, by the way, the Coast was really outstanding. Whoa, 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 what? <laughs> uh, where are my socks? <laughs> it's unbelievable. That kid, oh, well, she, she won't turn away from it. It's like a woman walking past the mirror. No woman will walk past the mirror. You ever see them? I watch it in a hotel. Any lobby where there's a mirror, a woman walks past, she stops. Right? It's like, it's like there's a red light. You know? And then she goes on. Right? Compliments the same thing. Everybody, that's not, that's, there's nothing wrong with saying thank you. Don't let it go to your head. And don't think that you're the only one in the, you're the, only one in the, in the, in the generation who's good at this. You're, there are other people who are good at things too. But to say thank you, that's not, that's not a problem. Now, I want to take you back a little further. What was the main trait of Avram Avinu that we know of? Chesed. chesed. He's the Ish Chesed. Okay? What was the trait of Yitzchak? Gvura. Gvura. Din. Yeah. Strict justice, right? What about Yaakov Avinu? MS. MS. Okay. Take a look at the life of Avram Avinu for a second. It starts off, he abandons his elderly father. He throws his nephew out of the house. He gets involved in a world war. He, uh, uh, what do you call it? He throws his son out of the house. He takes a blade and commits an act of self-mutilation on himself and on his entire household. And he takes another knife into the neck of his other son. Right? And he's the Ish Chesed in the Torah. He is the man of chesed, of kindness. We never find anybody in the Torah running around with a knife as much as Avram Avinu and getting involved in a world war, and he's called the Ish Chesed. Isn't that interesting? And what is Yitzchak? Din, strict justice, right? The strict principle. So Yitzchak is the one whose name means laughter. He entertains his wife. He tolerates his wayward son. He walks away from a conflict with the plishtim, and he's called strict justice. And Yaakov Avinu is what? MS? He deceives his brother, deceives his father, deceives his brother, deceives Lava, deceives everywhere you, everywhere you touch Yaakov Avinu, it's a deception. The, be, the biggest con man in history. Isn't that interesting? And he's the Ish MS. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Okay. Who's the most humble person in the world? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu. And here, yeah, Mordechai, you, you too, right. And, Mo, <laughs> and, Mo, and Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Moshe Rabbeinu. So he becomes the most famous man in history. Most, with the most public acclaim of Moshe Rabbeinu. Isn't that interesting? And you find this pattern repeating itself constantly in the Torah. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 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 Tamar. Tamar. Not eat Tamar. Tamar, the, gir <laughs> the girl's name. Tamar, who is Yehuda's daughter-in-law. So here's a girl who the Torah says that Yehuda solicited her because she, two husbands died and she wanted to have children with Yehuda. And why didn't he recognize her? Because she was extremely sneeous when she was his daughter-in-law. She never, he never saw what she looked like. And as a result of that, she had kings and prophets, the Gemara says, came from Tamar. Yehuda and Tamar got married and that's where the kings came from. Why is the merit of her sneeze? And where did Yehuda find her? Sitting on a crossroads, behaving like a harlot. And she's called sneeze. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And we find it again in Shavuos. We just had this on Shavuos. Boaz goes out to the field, and he sees a Midianite woman. He says, who's they? And the Gabar says, Boaz? The head of the Sanhedrin? He's looking, he's looking at the girls? Boaz is and so what did he notice about Ruth? Because she was so tzniyas. She was eye-catching litzniyas. I know that's a bit of an oxymoron. <laughs> she was eye-catching litzniyas. Because everybody else in the field was jumping down on the free-for-all, trying to get the grains, and she would bend down very daintily to pick it up. She would do everything tzniyas. Yet, she goes down at midnight to the granary alone with him. And what comes from that? The Davidic line. Now, so what you find in the Torah constantly is people are being credited for one behavior doing the opposite. So you should be way ahead of me by now. What does that mean? What does that really mean? That means that the opposite, the opposite is what our job in life is. If you're a softy, if you can't say no to somebody because you're just a sweet person, a soft person, and you can't say no, and a guy who comes to you with a, with, with a rusty needle dangling out of his arm asking you for a buck and you can't say no, you're not an ish chesed. 
you're just a softy. You're, 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 you're a softy. You, you've got no spine at all. Then you're supposed to say no. And if you can't tolerate the wayward son when he should be tolerated, or you can't take a knife to the side, that, then that means that you're not controlling the trait. The trait's controlling you. If you can't say a lie when you should say a lie, that means you're not a man of truth. You just, you just got, no, you get, got no sense for what you should be saying at the time. Rev Dessler says, truth is not saying yes when it's yes and no when it's no. Truth is saying the right thing at the right time. If a guy holds a gun to your head and says, if you're a White Sox fan, I'm going to kill you. No, that's a bad example. I don't want any, I don't want any way to say, to say that you really are, but then you're going to lie. Khalila. If a guy says, if you're a, if you're a Red Sox fan, I'm going to kill you. And you are a Red Sox fan. And you say, well, I cannot tell a lie. I'm a Red Sox fan. Right? That's not MS. That's not MS. That's, that's the dumbest thing you possibly do. The tr- saying the right thing, that's MS. Saying the right thing is MS. If your wife says to you, how was the, how was the chicken? I was like, you know, it's okay. I mean, it's a, you know, it tasted like it lived long ago, you know, but it, you know, somehow this one didn't make it. And you say, well, you know, uh, mm, you know, mm, you know, you, well, okay, food, maybe, you know. Your wife says to you, how do you like, how do you like the new sweater I bought? And you're thinking to yourself, you know, the Salvation Army must have had a clearance sale, you know. You know, you, know, you say, wow, lovely, terrific, what, beautiful, beautiful. Why? Because she thinks it is. She thinks it is. And that becomes MS. That becomes MS. And therefore, the, a person has to know that in Avodah Hashem, we got to use the opposite and go in the other direction. And certainly when it comes to the difference between how I treat, I'll get to you one second, either, how I treat myself and how I treat other people could be completely different. You know, the Gemara says, a man should spend less on himself than necessary and more than he could afford on his wife and children. The Gemara says, how do you like that? You know why? The Gemara says because he, they're dependent on him. And he's dependent on a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And obviously, obviously the Gemara is trying to communicate. If you want a Kodesh Baruch Hu, uh, to help you out, to make sure you help them out. And we usually do the opposite, by the way. Right? For myself, you know, <laughs> a wife comes home, you know, a kid comes home, you know, and you know, a father takes him to task for spending an extra couple of bucks. You know, a kid comes home with an empty Coke kit. Where do you get a Coke? I bought it, you know, on the vending machine. I thought, well, you know, vending machine, what, are you going to do this every, you know how much it costs? I take next time, take a bottle, you know, as a whole speech because of 25 cents or 50 cents or, you know, it becomes a whole big deal. And the father himself, what he does, oh, that's okay. And the chas to show him, anybody in the family makes a mistake with money, you know, da 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 the firing squad. Yeah. yeah. And the father goes and lose thousands of dollars in a bad investment, then nobody's allowed to say boo. No, there nobody's lost, and it's exactly the opposite. Ourselves, we should be rigid with the family. You got to cut them slack. Okay, they're obviously they're parameters, and that's what the Torah is teaching you. What the parameter? A wife goes and buys. This happens all the time for married people. It happens all the time. A wife comes home and she, you know, she she was out buying, and she bought herself a sweater, and she comes home and says, "I bought a, I bought a, I bought a new sweater today. Really? And how much was it? You know, about you know about seventy bucks. I bought a seventy bucks for a sweater. I mean, I thought we spoke about this. I mean, we have a budget. I thought what. Well, I mean, what, is it going to be every day? You're going to do this every day? And next thing you know, it's going to be a boat. Right? Men are always worried about their wives buying boats. Right? <laughs> I've yet to meet the woman who's bought a boat. Right? She bought a sweat. You know, I, so what? Well, you never, you never splurged all of a sudden. You never went out. And that's exactly what the Torah says. That's what Rabbi Shabbat That's what the Torah does. Yeah, go ahead, Itamar. What is the end goal of, of basically addressing your, your wife's proclivities? Excellent question, Itar. The Rambam says that if a person sees, if a person sees that they're out of control in any area, they should go to the opposite extreme. That's what the Rambam says. If you see that your guy gets angry, go to the opposite, and even things that should get you angry, don't get angry about. Do that for a while until you got it out of control. Then go back to the middle, what the Rambam calls the golden path. The goal is to always go on the golden path. The problem is when a person sees, and this happens, and this happens, I probably, you know, I, I know that I've been, you know, it, it could be with drinking, and it could be with a certain food, and it could be with certain behaviors. I've been a little out of control over here. I've been doing a little too much of this. You know, a guy, guy gets involved in sports. You know, I've been, I've been really watching too much sports or involved in too much sports for, oh, I've been overdoing it. 
Okay, so go to the opposite, deprive yourself for a while, go to the opposite stream and allow yourself to kind of kind of shift back to the middle. That's what the Rambam says. But the goal is to be a balanced person. The goal is not, you know, <laughs> the problem is when we talk about extremism, the general definition of being an extremist is anybody who does more or less than I do. <laughs> right? So if I jog a mile a day and this guy jogs four miles a day, that's a bit extreme. And if he doesn't jog at all, so you're extreme. What's the right? The right is what I do. That's how we generally think about things. That, that's extreme. It, you know, in Judaism, they always talk about the ultra orthodox. The, we, we're not. We're not the uh, super. We're not the very religious. We're the ultra orthodox. Ultra orthodox. Ultra. There's a. There's a. There's an implied uh, uh, flaw here. We're ultra orthodox. In other words, the ultra. Or, there's orthodox, so they're doing it right. And then there's the ultra orthodox. You know, we've gone we've gone above and beyond what what really needs to be done based on their judgment. So where is it considered extremism is a tricky tricky line. In general, in general, the Chazonish says don't do anything strange in serving God. That's extreme. Don't do any shouldn't be anything strange. There are plenty of people who are doing it. It should all be balanced. You're allowed to laugh. You're allowed to have fun. You're allowed a little entertainment. We are allowed to be balanced people. It's a mistake to think that to be a Torah Jew means that, it, it, first of all, don't smile. That's the first thing. Don't smile. Don't smile. Chas v'shalom, you might crack your face. Don't smile. That's not, that's not Torah. That's not, that's not Torah. That's not Torah. It's got to be very, very balanced. That's a tricky, where that line is is often trial and error. One of the benefits, one of the benefits when, 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 when you get married, so one of the benefits of a wife is the wife knows the difference between what you want and what you need. So for example, a wife knows a husband needs to relax. Now I know I need to relax, and I know I want to relax. So when I first got married, when I first got married, I was in Kolo, and I was really, really from. I mean, I was from. I told you, I, I threw stones at cars on Tuesdays. I mean, I was really, <laughs> I was really into it. And, and at a certain point, I needed to kick back a little bit. I said to my wife, listen, I got to... You know, I, I need an outlet here. It's either sports or politics. So I always said, definitely sports. I hate politics. Okay, so, so that was my, that was when I was allowed to start following. So I had been off of sports for about a year and a half. I went through serious withdrawal syndromes. And then eventually I got, you know, now, if it was up to me, it was up to me, I could follow sports basically all day long without taking a drug. Fasting wouldn't be a problem if I, if I, you know, I'd be able to get through every day 12, 12 hours, no food, no food, no drink, just as long as it's sports. My wife said 15 minutes once a week on Motzei Shabbos should be sufficient, right? So then there's a little bit of a, you know, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. She knows what you need, I know what I want. And in all areas of Avodah Hashem, she could tell you when you're overdoing it, and she could tell you when you're underdoing it. And that's one of the benefits. So I said, "Well, I don't know if I'm going to. I don't know if I if I'm really going to make it to Shul. This or I'm not feeling that well. You're fine. You can go to Shul. Well, yeah, you're, you're fine. <laughs> I guarantee you, if the, somebody would come in with a tennis racket, you'd be good enough to play tennis right now. Yeah, you can go to Shul. Yeah, yeah, just go, just go. Right. And sometimes you'll say, "No, you know what? You don't, you shouldn't go today. Today you have to stay in bed. You don't feel well. Don't don't push yourself." And she knows that's what you have. That's one of the benefits. But in general. We're looking for a sense of balance. Okay, now, one other point here that I wanted to get to yesterday. Shlomo HaMelech said, and the quote from Shlomo HaMelech was, Amarti echkema v'hirachoka many." Shlomo HaMelech said, I said I would become wise, and I see that wisdom is distant from me. That's a pasuk. Shlomo Melech said that. Why did he feel this? Excuse me. Why did he feel that wisdom is distant? Why? Because of one mitzvah in the Torah that he doesn't understand. What's the one mitzvah? The Parah Aduma. I understand. In 612 mitzvahs, you do understand. So why is it considered that you're? He said, "I wanted to get achieve wisdom, and I see it's distant from me because you don't understand one mitzvah." So I mean, 612 out of 613 is a pretty good batting average, right? The answer is, the answer is that Shlomo Melch is concerned. Ezra, you got an idea what the answer is? No, no, okay, don't. one second. So Shlomo Melch, what's he concerned about? What he's concerned about is that, well, first of all, if I don't understand this, who said my understanding of all the other ones is correct? It's almost like the guy who's fixing, I don't know if you ever tried fixing a lamp. You know, you take the lamp apart, and you put it back together, and you're left with one there's one screw that you're left with, 
And it's just like, well, I guess I didn't need this. You know, you see it. So, yeah. <laughs> then you turn out the lamp and you short the electricity in the entire city. It blows out, you know, because you didn't put the one, you know. So, yeah, yes, I know it happened. That's why I don't fix lamps anymore. <laughs> I've been sued by the city. <laughs> you know, so, see, you know, you know well, well, you know, if, I, if this is wrong, what else is wrong? If this isn't clear, I didn't figure this one out. Maybe I have, you know that the Gemara says, an unbelievable piece of Gemara. If you look it up, it's in Psachim and Chaf Beis. It appears in a couple of places. There was somebody named Shimon HaAmsuni. And Shimon HaAmsuni, you know, the Torah says the word S, right? Aleph Tuf. Aleph Tuf. Every time the Torah said the word S, he darshaned it. Which word did you understand? Darshaning means the same way that the Gemara analyzes certain things that we learn from certain psukim. Every time it said the word S, which we don't have a translation for that in, 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 in English, right? For example, if a person says, Ani rotze et ze, you could have just as easily said, Ani rotze ze. And that word S, we don't have a translation for it. So if the Torah put it in, there's a lesson to be learned for it. So you spend the lifetime analyzing and expounding on what are we derived. I mean, you've learned enough Gemara to know. We learn things from Sukkim and every extra letter and every extra dot in the Torah teaches us something. And he darshan every single S in the Torah. Every single time he said the word S, what do we learn from this? Then he got stuck. Because there's one point where it says, Es Hashem Elokecha Tira, you must fear Hashem your God. And it starts with the word S. And he said, how could it possibly be? How could it possibly be Es Hashem Elokecha Tira? You got to fear God. How can we equate anything to fearing Hashem? And therefore, I haven't got a clear resolution. I cannot resolve what this S is for. So he withdrew from everything, his life work. He said, delete the entire package. So his Talmudim said to Rebbe, but what about all the S's that you darsh and everything else? In other words, his approach was, if this isn't, I haven't got something for this, then maybe everything else I've said is incorrect. So Tamid said, yeah, but what about all that work? He said, the same way they got reward for analyzing it and expounding on it, I'll get reward now for withdrawing. I get reward for withdrawing because at the end of the day, I'm looking for MS. If it's not truth, if it's not MS, then I got to withdraw and I'll get reward for that. My work is not in vain because we get rewarded based on our effort. And I got to withdraw because I don't know that it's true. Says the Gemara. Then Rabbi Akiva came along. And Rabbi said, no, no, I got something for it. Es Hashem Elokecha Tira. It's to include Talmidei Chachamim. They have to have a certain awe of Torah scholars. That's what Rabbi Akiva said. So, Shlomo Melech takes a look at Parah Aduma. Gee, I understand this. I understand. 612. Uh, 609, 610, 611, 612. Uh-oh. Got stuck on this one. Right? Amarti echkem of Rechokem. It's distant. Wisdom is distant. If I can't get this one, I don't know if I'm right about the other ones. Number one. Number two, it emphasizes... Number two, you know what it emphasizes? It emphasizes the depth of even one mitzvah. You could be, a, I'm a multi-millionaire, but there's a billion dollars right here. I don't know which one is worth how much. And so you got a billion dollars worth of wisdom in para aduma if I don't, so I'm still distant from wisdom. Who says because I got everything else that I'm near, oh, it's only one little bit that's left. How do you know how much is left? I mean, you would travel to outer space. Well, I got pretty far over here. Yeah, but yeah, do you know how much of, of space is left out there? I have no idea. Okay, you have no idea. There could be, there could be 20 times as much as the distance that you've gone. So you're farther than you could imagine. And that's what Shlomo Amel says, the wisdom of Torah. That's what I told you yesterday. The Sefer Echoradim says, if a person would, if a person would live 2,000, 1,000 years twice, you would not fathom the depth of even one minute. So Shlomo Amel doesn't know how much is left over there. So if I can't figure that out, if I haven't understand this, I don't, you know, I'm distant from all wisdom. By the way, the commentaries, I heard Rabbi, Rabbi Leff, he explained, why was it, I mean, who was the S expert of the generation? Shimon Amsuni or Rabbi Akiva? Who was the S expert? Shimon Amsuni was the S expert. So why, if Shimon Amsuni couldn't figure that out, so why could Rabbi Akiva figure it out? How come oh, Rabbi Kiva came along and said, no, es Hashem Lechadir, that includes Tamir Chachamim. Why did Rabbi Kiva figure it out? Shimon Sunni was the one who spent a lifetime on it. Why should he be able to figure it out? It's similar to the three steps back that Moshe takes. Sometimes you have to clear your side vision before you can see clearly. 
you're you're onto something. We'll get back. We'll get back. I'm gonna come back to that. I want to come back to that for in a second. Rabbi Leff explained that you see sometimes in life you're so desperate to show you're right that you've lost your objectivity. Shemunam Sunni, he knew that there was a possibility. He knew Es Hashem Elokecha Tira could be including Torah scholars. He knew that was a possibility. But I don't trust my judgment right now. Because if my judgment is, I've got to come up with something, otherwise i got a lifetime of work that's going to get deleted over here. So is, am, I, am I pursuing the path of MS now, or do I have a little personal bias here? i got to step out. I have to step out of the race now. Then Rabbi Akiva comes along. He's got nothing, he's got nothing riding on it. That includes Tamil Oh, no, Rabbi Akiva has ratified it. That's something else. I've got too much of a personal, a personal, you know, the Supreme Court, I was explaining to my, I was explaining to my wife last night, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. They predicted it, they knew in advance which judge is going to pass it, pos- which judge is going to rule. You got six conservative judges and three liberal judges. They knew who's going to rule what. In Torah, that never exists. We think Hillel was always the lenient one. Shammai is the machmir one, right? Shammai is always stringent. No, not true. Not true. There are plenty of times where Shammai is, is lenient and Hillel is. We don't know in advance. There's no like, well, Hillel's worldview. There's a worldview. There's only one view. The view is the view of the Torah. How do you understand Torah over here? They can't predict in advance what he's going to say. Oh, he's going to be machmir. And over here, they make, I don't know what you need a Supreme Court for. I don't even know why they got to get sent it to the Supreme Court. Just count the judges. Oh, there's six conservatives and three liberals. Well, that one's gone. Right? Before you even get to the Supreme Court, I know the ruling before the game's over. It's like knowing the results of the game before you watch the game. I know what the results are going to be, so what's, what's the point? In Torah, it doesn't work that way. There are personal biases. Oh, I have a personal bias, therefore I'm going to rule a certain way. you got to examine it on its own merits. Shimon Amsudi says, I can't. I've got too much writing on this. If I didn't understand it, now I go, oh, I'm, maybe you're forcing it in. Maybe you're, you're forcing an explanation because you got a personal bias. Now let's go with what Ezra said. One of the commentaries points out, you know, sometimes I don't know the first thing about art. And uh, I, I was embarrassed. I did embarrass. I used to laugh at art. Like, oh, what's the big deal? You know, Rembrandt, you know, that sort of thing. You know, what's the big deal? Take a, take a picture with a camera. So I was once in a doctor's office. You know, they got these prints on the walls. So I walk over to one of the prints, and I, I don't know, I don't see anything here. And I look at the name, you know, it says something like Goldstein. You know, I look over at another pig point painting, it wasn't that impressed. You know, it says something like Murphy. I don't know what, you know, the name at the bottom. I don't know what the, then I walk over to another painting, I'm looking at it, and I say, well, you know, there's something about this, this is really interesting. There's something about this is, oh, this is pretty enchanting. And I look down and I go, Van Gogh. And I go, oh, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, I guess there is some, there's more to it than I thought. And it got me, I had known the first thing about it. It's a little strokes, little shorts. Something about it was enchanting, much more than Goldstein and Murphy, that I can tell you. Right? So, so sometimes when you're trying to appreciate a painting, what do you have to do? You look up at a painting, I don't see anything. Also, sometimes you kind of step back. Don't art do, artists do that all the time? First, you've got to wear the hat on an angle right, to show that you're an artist. They have a goatee. Right, and you hold, you know, and then at a certain point, you kind of, kind of step back and you look, you, you look. And sometimes when you move back, as you move back, the whole thing comes together. So, Shlomo Amel said, Amarti Echkema, I said I would turn out wise, Vihi Rechoka Mimani. Sometimes I got to back off. That means in Torah, commentaries explain, there are a lot of things we'd like to understand, but it could very well be we're not capable of understanding it. If you try to explain a jet engine to a three-year-old child, a four-year-old child is not capable of understanding how a jet engine works. He's just not capable. He does not have the, intelli- the mental capacity to understand how a jet engine works. It doesn't mean a jet engine doesn't work. It just means he's got a limitation on what he could understand. It doesn't mean the fact that I don't understand calculus doesn't mean that there isn't this discipline called calculus. I just don't understand it. The same way, there are going to be concepts that we are not capable of understanding because HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us with a limited capacity of understanding. Amarti Echkema, I've been working on this, I'm trying to penetrate the wisdom, and I'm getting frustrated. Take a step back. Take a step back. That's not within your capability just now. Take a step back. 
I guess uh, sometimes even as you back off, you might understand it a little better. But the fact that you don't understand it, I mean, it, it, there's a given, certainly in physics, physics professors, physics uh, the, at the high lev level of physics, if I can't explain it according to physical realities, then it can't be. Which is why many of the top physicists were atheists. Right? Shimon Am Sunni, by the way, didn't want to pull an Einstein. You know that Einstein, they found that in certain equations, he added in factors that didn't exist because he had to make the equation come out. <laughs> How do you like that? Uh, really? Yeah, really. Yeah, really. And Shimon Am Sunni wasn't willing to do that. Sometimes it's a Marty Echkema Virachokem. You know what? Back off. Just back off. You may, you're, 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 you've got to recognize where your line of understanding is. That's what the Torah is telling you. All right? To be continued.